Privyet, Debro Palsolovit to Ralph Reeds. Brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I continue the ongoing miniseries Black Gangster by Donald Goines. Divide Nachnium. Let the reading commence. Chapter 17 the winter wind had run most of the night people off the streets and into the bars and after-hour spots, pool rooms, and greasy spoon restaurants. The neon lights beckoned them to the dim-lit places of entertainment that were their very existence. Many had been victimized, but still they returned night after night in search of fugitive pleasures. The dope fiends, whores, muggers, and other parasites who earned their income off of them moved with them through the shadows. Frankie, a tall, brown-skinned lesbian, walked from one end of the silver dollar bar to the other, cursing fluently. I'm not going to pay no goddamn protection dues so that my whores can work, she yelled in her masculine voice. A short, slim negro spoke up from the bar. You must not have seen what happened to Chico's girls, did you? He asked, glad of a chance to put this arrogant dyke on the spot. That's because they had a pump for a man, Frankie replied harshly. You didn't see it happen to any of my girls, did you? A fat prostitute sitting in the rear of the bar remarked dryly. It might be because you've been paying your dues these past few weeks just like the rest of us. You telling a goddamn lie, Frankie said, glaring at the girl. If I was you, bitch, I'd think twice before telling that goddamn lie again. She stared at the other people in the bar. I ain't paying a damn penny and ain't planning on paying one either. Fat Daddy, Ape Man, and Brute entered the bar on the last of the conversation. Before Frankie had got all the words out of her mouth, Ape Man had grabbed her by her shoulders and swung her around. He slapped her twice across the mouth. Bitch, he yelled. Just cause you look like a man, don't be trying to fill a man's shoes. Because you might find yourself in more damn trouble than you know how to handle. With the speed born of long experience, Frankie pulled the knife and lunged at Ape Man. The move was so swift that it caught Ape Man unprepared. He threw up his arms as Fat Daddy moved in, catching Frankie's right arm in midair. He grabbed her other arm and twisted it behind her back until she had to stand on her tippy toes. The knife dropped slowly from her fist. He slammed her to the floor and Brute stepped in and kicked her in her stomach. As she lay squirming, Ape Man leaned down and snatched the back of her head, twisting his fingers around in her hair. Have you got the money for them six whores you got working, Frankie? He asked harshly, then slapped her across the face. Frankie managed to prop herself up on one of her elbows. She stared at Ape Man. You Dirty, black, son of a bitch, she screamed. I'll see that you pay for this. She spit straight into his face. Ape Man stood up and wiped the spit from his face with the back of his hand. Then he drew back his foot and kicked her in the side. Before he could kick her again, a heavy-set Negro woman ran up with some money in her hand. Here, man, she yelled, pushing the money towards him. Here's $28. Ain't but five of us girls working tonight, and whatever I'm short of, you can pick up later. Just leave our man alone. Ape Man slowly stuck the money into his pocket and watched Frankie trying to get to her feet. 
As soon as she reached her knees, he kicked her brutally on the side of the head. Next time, bitch, don't be telling people what you're going to do. If you got any kind of sense, you won't be late with your payments. Because if you are, I'm going to knock all the gribbers off your ass. Two young boys, notebooks in their hands, moved up and down the bar collecting money from the pimps and whores while the fearsome threesome watched closely. With the help of three of her girls, Frankie made her way out of the bar. One of the girls waved down a cab. At her apartment building, Frankie paused on the steps and waited for one of the girls to open the door. After they entered the apartment, she spoke to the girls. You bitches, get in the bedroom and stay there until I tell you to come out. She picked up the telephone and dialed long distance. I want to speak to either Black Pete or Tommy Hall, she demanded when the masculine voice answered on the other end. This is Tommy speaking, the voice replied. This is Frankie, baby. I'm having a whole lot of trouble over here in this funky city, Tommy. Anytime a black bitch is as dirty as you, Frankie, she's supposed to have a lot of trouble, baby. I'm not bullshitting, Tommy. I'm in trouble, and I need your help. How much money have you got, Frankie? I've got $500 I could put my hands on in the next five minutes. It's gonna cost you more than that, Frankie. Wait a minute, Tommy. This is me, baby. You don't even know what I want you to do yet. Don't make no difference, honey, he said coldly. I know what's going on over there, and I don't want no part of it. You mean you wouldn't come over here for an old friend like me? She asked slowly. As much money as we got floating around Chicago right now, baby, I don't see. Why you don't just pack up and bring your ladies here. It would save you some money besides the cash you have to pay me if I made the trip. I'm not worried about saving money. All I want to know is how much are you going to charge to make a hit on a punk over here for me? After a long pause, he replied, For you, baby, I'd do it for $1,500. What? Frankie yelled. How in the hell are you going to charge me like that? It ain't but one guy, baby. I don't want you to hit J. Edgar Hoover. Just a small time punk. That's all. Listen, Frankie, and I'm not trying to snow you. If you wasn't such a good friend, I wouldn't take the job unless it paid three grand or more. Tommy waited for a moment, listening to the silence on the other end of the line, then continued. Dick, baby, I told you I knew what was going on over there. Alfonso showed up here two weeks ago and gave us the rundown on what Prince is doing. And I don't want to be no part of that stud. Okay, Tommy, when will you be here? What about the money? When will I get it? This ain't no game I'm playing. You get your money as soon as the job is done. All right, girl. Me and a couple of the boys will drive over tonight. So have my money ready. I don't plan on being there no longer than a few hours. Tommy had hung up. She walked over to the bedroom door and called the girls out. All of you go back to work now. After you finish, stay with each other. I don't want none of you coming back here before this time tomorrow night. Is that understood? Okay, Frankie, one of the girls answered. You sure you ain't gonna need anything before the morning? Just do as I say, Frankie replied softly. After the last girl had gone out, she leaned on the door for a brief second, then walked over to the couch and stretched out, waiting patiently for the arrival of her friends. Across town in another apartment, Prince listened quietly to his lieutenants. Preacher continued to argue his point. I don't care what Danny says, Prince, he said loudly. We catch pure hell trying to collect money from them whores in Black Bottom. That's bullshit, Danny snapped back. 
Them whores on your turf pay off way better than the welfare. Preacher laughed, but his eyes were black chips. You don't understand, Danny. Last night, some bull diker tried to stab Ape Man when he tried to collect. At least he can catch up with his whores and try to collect. Them fat bitches in my district change locations so much, I don't know where to look for them most of the time. Danny spoke to Prince, seeking sympathy. Prince walked over to the far end of the room and removed the cover from a large wall map. Here's something that's gonna really make you holler, Danny. If you think you got troubles now, he removed the pencil from his pocket and drew a line on the map. You know that warehouse down by the waterfront that all those trucks pull in and out of? You ain't talking about that big trucking company. How about a block from the waterfront, are you? Danny asked. That's right, Danny. Right around the corner from where Fat Daddy picks up his waterfront collections, Prince replied. Danny stopped and stared at Prince for a moment. He seemed to be stifling an outburst. Prince, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, it ain't gonna be nothing but trouble, man. Prince smiled coldly. You might be right, man. What I got on my mind is that you won't have far to send Fat Daddy to pick up the contributions from the trucking company. What you mean is that I won't have far to go to bury our pickup men, Prince. Stop and think on this, Prince, Danny urged desperately. What you're talking about is going up against the Mafia. It ain't that them truckers is all that tough, Prince. It's the backing behind them. They ain't gonna stand still for no shakedown either. Remember, man, you ain't gonna be shaking no trucking company down, man. We're gonna be shaking the mafia down, and they ain't going for it. He was saying what Prince had already thought about, but it didn't change his mind. He didn't believe anyone in his right mind would turn down his request. If the truckers wanted to keep their trucks rolling, they would pay up. It was impossible for them to refuse his demands and hope to stay in business. Prince walked over and picked up his sport jacket up off a chair. Don't worry about a thing, he said, appearing more confident than he actually was. I've taken care of everything. By this time tomorrow night, we'll have one of the largest trucking companies in the city paying us protection dues. Have you heard from them yet? Danny snorted. Prince made his favorite motion of impatience. Tomorrow night at the club, while we're paying off the other members, I'll personally show you the money that came from this big bunch of so-called gangsters. He stared at his men, unyielding, selfish, indomitable. He had chosen a path for them to follow, and they would follow, no matter what. The next morning, Fat Daddy and Brute stood in the outer office of the trucking company, waiting for the receptionist to come back and usher them in. I wish we could have found Ape Man. The same thought was running through Fat Daddy's mind. He tried not to reveal his slight fear, though, as he replied, I believe the son of a bitch was in his room shacking up with some bitch. If he was, I'll make sure Prince racks his ass up for it. Brute answered, a bit nervously. I done got about just enough of this waiting shit, Fat Daddy snapped, more from fear than anger. At that instant, a small fat man came into the office. He nodded at the two young blacks, walked across the room, and entered the door marked private without knocking. Shit, Brute exclaimed. If he could do that, so can we. Come on, Fat Daddy. Ain't no sense in us waiting no goddamn longer. Fat Daddy grabbed Brute by the arm. He could feel his heart beating wildly. Wait a minute, Brute. Maybe we ought to run over to the roost and get a few more guys first. Seeing his partner's fear, Brute gained courage from it. Had he mentioned getting help earlier, Brute would have quickly taken him up on it. Now, he wanted to show that he wasn't afraid. What the hell are you worried about, Fat Daddy? You got your pistol, besides a pair of brass knuckles, don't you? Before they could decide on what to do, 
The inner office door opened, and the secretary stepped out. She walked over to the coat rack and removed the coat. With a shake of her head, she motioned to the men to go in. You don't believe in being polite, do you? Brute asked. Not to scum, she replied over her shoulder as she walked out the door. Bitch! Brute yelled after her. They entered the inner office and stood near the door. Come over here, the small fat man ordered sharply. We want to get a better look at you. Sitting behind the desk was a tall, slim man with a pencil-lined mustache. As the two men moved to the middle of the room, he laughed. Where's the other guy who's generally with you boys? He asked in a heavy voice that was surprising from such a thin man. The fat man pulled a notebook from his pocket. He thumbed through the pages, then pulled three pictures out. He's asking about the big black one, he said, staring down at the pictures. These punks call themselves the Big Three, Ed, he laughed harshly. Brute and Fat Daddy stared at each other in amazement. How in the hell did you know, Brute asked, his voice belligerent. The man called Ed stood up from behind the desk. There is very little we don't know about you punks. He said dryly, then added, Accept what brings you here to my office. If you know so much about us, Brute replied slowly, You should really know what brings us here. Well, I don't, the man answered easily. I don't have the slightest idea what you boys want. Well, you should, Brute continued. Everybody that runs a business in this neighborhood pays protection dues, and the time has come for you to start paying yours. Ed sat back in his chair laughing. I told you so, Bill. That's just what these punks came here about. He continued to laugh until tears ran out of his eyes. Bill didn't seem to find anything funny, though. Just how much is this organization supposed to pay, may I ask? His words were polite, but his blue eyes were cold. Fat Daddy began to feel a little more assured. He spoke up for the first time since entering the office. As of today, you owe us $1,000. Bill lit a cigarette. Ed, I think these punks are serious. He glanced back at the two men as though he had just seen them for the first time. Fat Daddy leaned forward, now confident that everything will work out right. It's like this, Ed. Every time one of your trucks turns down 8th Avenue and comes to this building or your other one across the street, it costs you one dollar. Over 500 trucks have pulled in and out, and we do count both ways. Yeah, Ed answered slowly. I guess you are counting both ways to come up with a figure like that. We figure it this way, Ed. You ain't got to pay the money. Since the truck drivers are mostly brokers, all you got to do is tell them and they'll all pay the $2 every time they come to your warehouse. Brute grinned. Bill walked over and picked up the phone. He dialed the number, let it ring once, then hung up. That's just who I figured you'd want to give the screwing to, the truck drivers. Just what it is out of your fucking pocket, Brute demanded. I don't see you driving no fucking truck. Bill answered quietly, his voice revealing no anger. No, I don't drive a truck, but I'm connected with them. My job is to protect the drivers from just this very thing, and that's what I'm going to do. Brute pulled a set of brass knuckles from his pocket and slipped them on. That's a pretty big job you cut out for yourself, little man, he growled. We just might have to show you how rough it's going to really be. Before Brute finished speaking, he had started to move forward. Bill quickly stepped behind the desk. Ed never moved from his seat. He just leaned forward and pushed a concealed button, and the outer door bust open, and four huge men rushed in. All of them carried iron pipes, swinging them freely. There was no contest. Brute fought desperately to get behind the desk to reach the men who had set him up, but it was a losing battle. 
As he sank to his knees beside Fat Daddy, he could hear someone yell, Don't kill him yet! It was Bill's voice. We have to find out where this guy Prince lives! Ed came from around the desk and glanced down at the two men on the floor. I wish there was some other way of handling this. I don't like it. The last thing I wanted was for someone to end up getting killed over this crap. It's out of your hands now, Ed, Bill replied. The only thing these punks understand is violence, and that's just what they're gonna get. A one-way trip to hell. Chapter 18 the music from inside the roost could be heard out on the sidewalk as the party inside went into full swing. A microphone had been set up and a group of girls were standing in front of it, singing the latest hit along with the record. Hey Ruby! A boy yelled from across the dance floor. What time is Prince gonna get here with that green stuff? Ruby, sitting at a table with a group, ignored the question until one of the young men with her addressed her directly. What about that, Ruby? What time is Prince showing up? I got to pay my boys off this evening or they're gonna worry me to death. Her chair squeaked as she pushed it back and stood up. Why don't you go and find a telephone and call him if you really want your money that fast? She replied over her shoulder as she started to walk away. The roost had been redecorated. There were new tables and booths around the dance floor, which had been sanded and varnished until it glowed with a glossy finish. The front door had been reinforced with two long iron pipes, making it impossible to kick in the door from the outside. As the buzzer rang from the outside, the two young door guards began removing the bars after first taking a quick peep through the slit. Prince came in, followed by Danny and Preacher. Each man carried a black bag about the size of what a doctor would carry. Prince crossed the dance floor and went into the back room, which had been converted into an office. Ruby followed and slammed the door on the over-anxious teenagers. Prince, what in the hell is Ape Man working out of? She asked. He motioned towards the desk before answering. Just dump the money out on top of it, Danny. You stack it up so we won't have no trouble counting it out when those kids start pouring in. He turned to Ruby. Woman, how in the fuck am I supposed to know what Ape Man is working out of? I ain't seen him in three days. He hesitated, then asked, Didn't he go with Brute and Fat Daddy to take care of that business? Hell no, she replied bluntly. I tried to reach you on the phone, but I couldn't catch up with you. She glided towards him with her swift, sinewy grace. Brute and Fat Daddy stopped at his place to pick him up, but he wasn't there. They called me and told me to tell you they were going on over by themselves. Prince shook his head. Again, he wished he had followed his right mind and left this job alone. He had believed from the first that it just might turn out to be trouble, but had ignored his hunch. Oh well, he reasoned. Whatever happened, he'd find a way to handle it. Prince pulled out a pack of cigarettes and lit one, trying to conceal his slight nervousness. It ain't nothing to worry about, baby. Ape Man is more than likely getting him a piece of leg somewhere, and it done got too good for him to let go. He laughed loudly. Where in the fuck could that bastard be, he wondered. I'll fix his goddamn ass whenever he does show up, he promised himself angrily. God damn, Danny exclaimed. I ain't never seen that much money in my life. He reached down and picked up some bills and let them trickle through his fingers the way a child would do. Preacher emptied his two bags of money. Prince, just how much is that on the desk anyway, he asked. Danny laughed excitedly. He ain't stifling Prince. God damn, that's a lot of cash for just one week's take. He hesitated, then added, Besides, we don't even know how much you took out for other expenses. What I took out for myself and other people that won't be here tonight would just about cover what you see on top of my desk right now, Danny. 
beautiful, baby. That's just beautiful. You mean to say, Prince, we don't even miss that money from them four dope houses the black cougars closed down? Preacher asked. A flash of anger crossed Prince's face, but he quickly covered it. He smiled tightly. That shit the damn cougars are working out of ain't about nothing. We open them same joints back up, only in different spots. I don't see no reason for us to have no goddamn shootout with them brothers. So I just move the joints when they pressure them. He glanced up at his men. He didn't want them to become worried about the black cougars, even though it was becoming a very sore spot with him. It went a lot deeper than just moving his dope houses. The pushers were becoming frightened to such a degree that even more money was no temptation. Two of them had just quit, packed up, and left the city. Ruby stopped stacking the money long enough to put her arms around Prince's neck. We got this city right in the palm of our hands, baby. She kissed him gently on the cheek. He unwound her arms from his neck. Not quite yet, baby he replied, but give us a little more time and it shouldn't take too fucking long. Ruby, go out and tell everybody that came to collect money from their district to get in line outside the door. Make sure that no more than two come in at a time. After all that goddamn noise and shit they made before, my nerves ain't up to handling it tonight. After the last couple to get paid off had left the office, Prince leaned back in his chair and lit a stick of reefer. He slowly made eight large stacks of money out of the pile left on the desk. He gave Preacher and Danny both a stack, then put one in his own pocket. He glanced down at the five stacks remaining. Baby, you see to it that Fat Daddy, Brute, and Eight Man get three of these, then find Donnie and give him one. The last stack is for you, baby. Take it downtown and get something for yourself you think I might like. Preacher moved towards the door. Since my old lady's belly is too big for her to do anything, I think I'll ease out of here and try and find me one of them young girls that just love to be with me. He grinned over his shoulder as he stopped before the door. I'll be around if you want anything, Prince. Prince smiled at him and waved him out of the door. He knew Preacher was just about the only married man in his gang. The rest of them just shacked up when the mood hit them, but Preacher had been married to Dee Dee for over three years. I think I'll do the same thing, Danny said, waiting for Prince to okay it. As the cigarette began to burn his finger, Prince put the reefer out and made a cocktail out of the roach. Get a table near the dance floor, he said contentedly. I'll be out there in a few minutes myself. The phone rang, and Ruby reached across the desk to pick up the receiver. Just a second, she said, holding out the receiver to Prince. Where you at? Prince asked sharply after listening for a few seconds. It shouldn't take you more than ten minutes to get over here, racehorse. Come through the alley and knock on the back door. I'll make sure no one sees you on this end. Ruby whistled as Prince hung up. Something must have really come up to make Racehorse come here, she said. Prince grunted his answer, then settled down to wait. Something always seemed to come up when he was hoping everything would turn out all right. He didn't have long to wait. In eight minutes, a slight knock was heard, and Prince stepped quickly to the back door. He removed a large two-by-four and unhooked three chains. The door swung open into the room and Racehorse stepped inside. His eyes quickly scanned the room, taking in everything of importance. Hi there, Ruby. What's been happening, girl? He asked politely. It's been a little while since I've seen you, baby. She flashed him a brief smile. I hope whatever brought you here ain't so important that I'll wish I hadn't seen you tonight. He shook his head. You know it's got to be bad or I'd never risk even coming over here, baby. I don't dig this section of the city no kind of way. Prince made sure the door was locked tight before joining the conversation. Let's make it as quick as possible, Race. I know the police have got this goddamn place watched. Racehorse glanced nervously at the back door. Man, I know the fuzz would catch hell trying to kick that door down, but how the hell would I get out if they were back trying to get in? Prince pointed to a rope hanging down from a hole in the ceiling on the east side of the room. That leads to the roof, 
From there, you can jump to the building next door. Then, you just follow the rooftops. By the time you come to the end, you should be at least eight houses away from here. Racehorse nodded. I'll get right to the point then. Eight man done got himself killed. His words had the effect of a gunshot. There was stunned silence in the room for a brief moment. You sure of that? Prince asked sharply, his mind reeling. There's no doubt about that part of it. The bastard is as dead as you'll ever get. It don't seem like anyone else in this whole city is up on this news, racehorse. Where do you come by all this first-hand information? I know couldn't none of them white whores you stay with be up on it. Prince tried to keep his confusion from showing. If me and Tony hadn't been over in Chicago picking up those Tommy guns, Prince, I might have stopped it. These cats come over from Shy the other day, and as soon as they hit the city, they called me up. After they couldn't reach me, baby, they went on and took care of the job they came for. Racehorse waited, watching closely. He was curious about the effect his words were having on Prince. He had realized that his message would produce some sort of impact, but he hadn't expected Prince to be shaken so hard. Prince managed to get himself together. At first, he had thought it was the Mafia striking back because he had attempted to pressure the trucking company, but he realized that couldn't be the reason. Who did it? The question was sharp and direct. Prince stared coldly at Racehorse, waiting for an answer. Racehorse walked over and sat on the edge of the desk. One of the studs was my rap partner in a bit a long time ago. He took the prison sentence, Prince, just so he could cut me loose. That don't mean shit! Ruby exploded. She had been trying to stay out of it, but her anger got the best of her. The stud knew Ape Man was one of Prince's men, so he shouldn't have touched him. Now he's going to have to pay for his error. Racehorse stared at Ruby for a moment before laughing. What's the deal here, Prince? He asked sarcastically. You got a bitch running your business now? Rudy blushed, scarlet, with more than anger. Just who in the hell do you think you are, Racehorse? Shut up, Ruby, Prince ordered. His eyes glittered as he stared from one to the other. We got enough problems without you two squabbling like kids. Racehorse, don't understand this. You say one of my boys got killed, yet you don't want to tell me who's behind it. I didn't say I wasn't going to tell you who was behind the killing, Prince. I just said I couldn't tell you who actually did the job. Prince shrugged. I don't like the idea of some butchers coming into my city and killing one of my boys and getting away with it, Race. But if you can put me hip to who wired him up for this, I'll let it ride for now. Racehorse grinned. You ever hear of a bull diker named Frankie? He waited until both of them shook their heads. Well, she called the boys in from Chicago. Seems as though she don't like the idea of having to pay for her ladies to work. Ruby walked over and removed the cigarette from behind Racehorse's fingers. She slowly lit a stick of reefer with it, then handed the reefer to Racehorse. Here, baby. Her voice was husky. I'm sorry about that little misunderstanding we had. You know you and me are a whole lot cooler than that, horse. You know how that goes, baby, Racehorse replied as he inhaled the sweet-smelling reefer. Everybody can't be right all the time, Prince he said, turning away from her. Let me try and straighten something out with you before we go into this thing any further. Come on out with it, Prince answered quietly. Racehorse removed a burnt-up joint from his mouth and made a cocktail. Look here, baby. These guys never would have called me if they didn't have something else on their minds besides idle gossip. Prince remained silent and waited for him to continue. The studs want you to toss them some business, Prince. That's the real reason the guys wasted the time getting in touch with me and pulling my coat to what went down. They say things are kind of slow and shy right now, and they seem to be catching pure hell waiting on somebody to call them with a decent contract. Prince laughed ruthlessly. This stud you've been talking with has plenty of nerve, Race. First, he kills one of my best men, then turns around and asks for a goddamn job. 
He acts like he ain't never heard of you, Prince. Or else he thinks your middle name is Pussy! Ruby snapped, her face flushed with anger. Racehorse threw her a savage glance, then spoke to Prince. That ain't the reason, Prince. The studs got a good idea of how this thing can be worked out between you and him. Just how would he like to handle it? Prince inquired, sarcasm dripping from his words. Wait a minute, baby, Racehorse said, well aware of Prince's ways. You done went and got the wrong impression already, man. You know what kind of business the guy deals in, Prince, so you know damn well he has to be careful. Plus, he don't trust you too much, baby, because of that killing. How the fuck would he work for me if he don't have any trust? The stud has an idea you might go along with using me as the middleman. That way, neither of you would have to ever meet. Ruby inquired sarcastically, Won't that put a little heat on you, racehorse? You know it does, Racehorse answered easily, but I trust this stud, and I'm also going to get me a small commission out of every job he takes care of to make up for the trouble I might have to go through. A sharp knock on the door ended the conversation. Who is it? Prince asked sharply. This is Preacher. I got some very important news for you, Prince, or I wouldn't be bothering you. Prince glanced at Racehorse, undecided. Don't worry about me, Racehorse said quickly. Me and Preacher grew up together. Let him in. The door was open halfway, and Preacher slipped through the crack. Well, look what the garbage truck dropped off, he said, then grinned at Racehorse. He stuck out his hand, and Racehorse jumped from the edge of the desk and grabbed it. I hear you've been coming up in the world, Preacher, he said as he pumped Preacher's hand. They tell me you done got to be just about the biggest frog in the pond down in Black Bottom. He grinned. How's your wife, man? Last thing I heard, you was on your way to becoming a daddy. Preacher grinned. Yeah, man, I got a son. His face brightened slightly. Besides that one, I got another one on the way. Prince locked the door. Whatever you got to say, get it over with, Preacher. We got some important business to take care of as soon as you finish. Preacher nodded, then blurted out his news. Man, it's all up and down the streets that the police have found Eight Man's body. The wire that's out is that he was shot five times. Now, I don't know how much of this is true, but everybody that comes into the club is talking about it. The way this city is right now, Ruby broke in, we can't afford to have someone kill one of our boys and get away with it. Racehorse glared at her, but remained silent. He understood what she was trying to do. She wouldn't be satisfied until the gunmen themselves were made to pay. The people in the know just about know what we are going to do about it, Prince replied. The only thing they don't understand is how we are going to do it. Prince walked over and opened the door. Preacher, I want you to have the members of the rulers put on their outfits. Cause there's going to be a hit made tonight. I want everybody who heard about this killing to know that we're getting ready to play payback before the night's over. After closing the door behind Preacher, Prince turned to Racehorse. This job tonight has got to be done in such a vicious manner, Horse, that even the hardest studs will be trembling at the thought of crossing one of my people. It ain't gonna be such a hard thing catching up with who's behind the killing, Prince. Frankie will more than likely be in her favorite bar partying tonight. The thing is, how am I going to get her out of the bar? Racehorse rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Don't worry about that part of it, Racehorse, Ruby said. I can handle it if Prince will give me the okay. She stared at her man, awaiting his agreement. Her eyes traveled quickly to Racehorse, then back again. It would be a long time before she forgot all the bitches he had called her. You really want part of this job? Prince asked her slowly. 
I don't just want part of this job, Daddy. I've already figured out just how it could be handled. And there won't be any complaints about it after I've handled it either. Racehorse glanced at Ruby, then back to Prince. What kind of crap is this, man? You think I'm going on a job with a bitch? Don't worry about her, Prince replied, smiling slightly. She can handle her end of it. She took care of that job on Billy without anyone helping her. Racehorse glanced at her nervously. If she handled that job, I guess it's all right. I still don't like the idea of working with a bitch. Ruby walked over to Racehorse and stared him in the eye. Before we're finished working with each other, you'll realize I got a different name than Bitch Race. That I fucking promise you. We have reached the end of this portion of the Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like, or rather love, to thank my queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You could contact me on Facebook, Ralph Anthony Garcia, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope at RGMC2407. Please email me, rgmc2407 at gmail.com, where, if you would like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash rgmc2407 or the cash app. My cash tag is rgmc2407. You can also find me on my other channel, my music channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, and right here at home on the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I'll see you kind folks on the continuation of the Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Spicy boy, dobroi nochi.